So welcome to this first of our four webinars that we're offering in June as part of our Bible Month series, exploring the book of Isaiah together. We're delighted that you're able to join with us tonight. And if you're willing to do so, we'd encourage you to like and subscribe to the various social media channels that we've been using to promote Bible Month this year. As I'm sure you're all aware, Isaiah is a highly significant book that sits right in the center of the Bible, not only in terms of where it appears, but in terms of its theological significance too. And it encapsulates the core strands of the Old Testament, summarizing the story and struggles of Israel and proclaiming God's plans and promises for his people. So in this first webinar during June, we'll be exploring the theme of rage and redemption, prophesying tough love today, picking up on that theme of tough love, exploring the church's prophetic role to both challenge injustice and celebrate fruitfulness in our contemporary society. Uh, you've probably noticed by now that I'm not Rachel Lampard. Uh, sadly, Rachel is unwell at the moment, and so I'm standing in for her in tonight's webinar. And of course, we send Rachel our thoughts and prayers at this time for a speedy recovery. I'm in fact Richard Armager, and I'm the Director of Learning and Development for the Methodist Church. I'm delighted to be joined by Ken Howcroft, by Hannah and David too, who will be guiding our reflections in this session. And I'll just let them briefly introduce themselves now um, at this point. So Ken, do you want to introduce yourself first? Hi, I'm Ken Howcroft. I'm a former president of Methodist Conference and former lots of other things as well. Uh, and even before that, I was formerly uh, a lecturer in New Testament studies at a theological college, uh, which I suppose gives you some sort of vague qualification to be here. And I'm part of the Walking with Micah reference group. Thanks, Ken. Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I work for the Joint Public Issues team, um, which is the Methodist Church, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the United Reformed Church, working together on issues of peace and justice. Um, and in that role, I do campaigns and church engagement. Thanks, Hannah. And David, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks. It's good to be here um, and to see everyone. I'm David Hardman and I, I too am a part of JPIT. And I'm the Methodist team leader. Thanks, David. So we're going to be um, very well guided through our reflection together by Ken, yes, Hannah and David tonight. And it's really good that you're able to do this stuff. So I want to just say briefly a little bit about walking with Micah, because I know that's what Rachel would have been doing had she been able to be here tonight. I've just popped the link into the chat for the uh, relevant page on the Methodist Church website. And I just want to say that walking with Micah, if you've not picked up on it, is a two year project and it aims to help people explore um, explore uh, what it means to be a justice seeking church. Sorry there, I just forgot my words for a moment. Um, linking in closely with our theme for tonight's webinar, of course. Uh, the name of the project draws on Micah 6, 8, and people will find inspiration for God's justice from so many parts of the Bible, just as we're doing from Isaiah tonight. But here, the prophet Micah reminded people that our worship is not acceptable without a commitment to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. But justice seeking is integral to our relationship with God because God's nature is just. And our calling as Methodists means we long for God's justice in the world, around the globe and in our own local communities. And Methodists are working for justice, responding to the needs and campaigning for change. Overall, Walking with Micah aims to encourage Methodists to live out our calling to seek justice and helping the Methodist Church to identify and focus on particular concerns and increase our effectiveness in acting for justice. As I've said, you can find out more on the relevant pages on the Methodist Church website, and the link is now in the chat. But without further ado, I'll hand over to Ken now to start guiding our thoughts in our time together this evening. Ken, over to you. Thank you. I'm hoping to share my screen. And I hope you can see that. Um, I'm going to talk about biblical justice and uh, particularly rooted in Isaiah. So what's justice? What's a just person? What does it mean for that person to live and act justly? What's a just society or community? What does it mean for it to organize itself justly? People have argued about these things from ancient times to now, 
yet somehow the answers to the questions remain elusive. Interestingly, Aristotle, that's him there behind me, Mr. Wesley's further back and darker. Uh, interestingly, Aristotle thought that it was easier for us to recognize injustice than justice. So we could say that we need to pay attention to our rage. If we think about what sort of things cause us to rage, we shall start to get an idea of what injustice is. And if we flip that on its head, we shall start to see what justice is. The Old Testament prophets, amongst other things, are good at rage. Since they present themselves as mouthpieces of God, it could be said that God is good at rage as well, and so, by extension, is Jesus. Let's be honest and call it rage, not righteous indignation. So what can the Bible tell us about justice? The answer may be not very much, unless we're clear about what we're asking. The word justice in English has become a very wide portmanteau term, which carries all sorts of things in it. To get more precision in English, we have to add all sorts of adjectives to the term. So, for example, we talk of social justice, economic justice, tax justice, racial justice, gender justice, political justice and legal justice, to mention just a few. All those things are justifiable concerns for followers of Jesus to have. The problem is, are we using the word justice the same way in each of them, in English? And we must beware of reading back into the biblical texts modern understandings of which are foreign to them. We must beware of missing some prompts or clues in those biblical texts as a result. Prophetic rage is a prominent theme throughout the Old Testament book that we know as Isaiah. The opening chapters in particular set up the theme. As the scholar John Goldingay has summarized, they claim that God's people are living as if they can ignore God's demands on their life, collectively and individually. God will therefore take action against God's people, but God will restore and turn the community into what it should be. The parable in Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 to 7 then describes how God's people are not producing the fruit for God that God's expecting. The second half of Isaiah 5 7 succinctly explains that idea. You have to forgive my Hebrew pronunciation at this point, but I'll try and make it consistent so you see the point. God is looking for mishpat and finds only mispah. God's looking for sedaka and finds only se'aka. The first of each of those pairs of terms, the mishpat and the sedaka, are often translated as justice and righteousness, respectively. But mishpat more narrowly applies to government and the discernment that's needed in the exercising of authority and the making of decisions. Whereas Sedaka refers to being upright and faithful and doing the right thing in relation to God and to your community. Taken together, the two terms point towards a faithful exercise of power in the community. The second pair, term in each of those pairs describes the reality of what God finds. Mispah points to vicious oppression that results in bloodshed. Sayaka points to the cries of indignation and pain that arise when people are treated unfairly and oppressively. There's a very thin dividing line between the two terms in each pair. The former almost too easily becomes the latter and all that's reinforced by the close wordplay in Hebrew between the words. The first term in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7, mishpat, also occurs in our key verse in Micah 6 8, where it's got the same sense of discernment in exercising authority and making decisions. 
though it's often translated as doing justice. The ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament perhaps began that trend. It used the word krima, which means a formal, often legal discernment and judgment. The same version also uses a related word, krisis, for mishpat in Isaiah 5.7, and then dikaiosune for sedaka, and that takes us briefly into the New Testament. Dikaiosune is a major term in the discussion about justice in Greek and Roman philosophy. Jewish and later Christian discussions began to be influenced by those traditions, and the term and related words became important in the New Testament and later, where it's often translated as righteousness. Unfortunately, translation of it into the Latin term justificatio, justification in English, has often skewed our understanding of it in the direction of quasi-legal judgments about whether an individual is to be saved or not. That loses the emphasis on the communal and societal aspects of justice in the Old Testament and also in the New. The Gospels and Paul in particular are concerned with how the community of God's people is organised and behaves in a godly way, and then how individuals behave within it. They're rooted in an Old Testament understanding that what God is, God does. So, for example, because God is holy, God seeks to make things holy. Because God is love, everything God does is an expression of love. When Paul writes of the righteousness of God, he means both that God is upright and that God also seeks to put everything right in relationship to themselves, to others, and to God's own self. And that takes us back to the opening chapters of Isaiah and the idea that God seeks to restore the community of God's people and to turn it into what it should be. In other words, to redemption. Rage and redemption are two sides of the same coin. That's true of God, of Jesus, and of the community of God's people, the body of Christ. The point of raging against injustice is to redeem. The passion to redeem and create justice necessarily involves identifying and raging against injustice. Jesus shows that that is what God is like, and we perhaps learn more from the stories about him than from sayings and statements. So some questions for you to talk about in buzz groups. You can pick any of these to talk about because you've only got a few minutes. How shall we be speaking as God's mouthpieces today? How do we avoid reading our own concerns back into the Bible or projecting them onto God? And where do we see Mispah and Seaka in the world today? And how do we help turn those into Mishpat and Sedaka, the faithful exercise of power in the community? Have we got everybody back now? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Sorry, it's just a short time. We want to keep moving with this. To help us gather things together, could you please put any comments or questions that you've got from those conversations into the chat? We might have time to pick one or two of them out now, but we will come back to all of them uh, towards the end uh, of, the, of the webinar. We're keen to see what you've been talking about. To there, the increasing divide between rich and poor. Yes, I could well imagine uh, a modern day Isaiah talking about that. And he does talk about poverty uh, and riches. Uh, earning the right to speak by our actions. Uh, could you... Could, Melanie, could you or someone expand on that for a moment? Can you unmute and explain that one? Yeah, we, we looked at the fact that very much in society these days, uh, people were once upon a time 
the church would have been listened to and indeed leaders would have been listened to. Um, now, unless you actually, you know, you've got what you say running through you like a streak of Blackpool rock. Um, and we, we spoke about how the fact some people say they, they don't want to listen to the Archbishop of Canterbury because they don't think he lives out what he says. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there is something about integrity, isn't there? And certainly the Isaiah is, is strong on, uh, on, on that. Yes. Um, I'm just picking out one or two. Would Isaiah have had a more receptive audience than a secular society provides today? Uh, I would have thought not. Uh, there's not much sign that any of the prophets were popular. Uh, and um, they are not understood and are not listened to. Don't forget, we have the value of retrospect and of believing that they were right. When you're actually in a situation at the time, those things are harder to see. Um, yeah, there's some great comments here. Yeah. Mouthpieces, helping individuals at work on the by speaking up for them. Yeah. Uh, speaking up for people is as much a prophetic, the people who have not got a voice is a very prophetic thing. Yeah. And we've got to avoid projecting our own agenda by seeing things within the concept of the whole biblical narrative. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, we all too easily assume that when you see a word that looks familiar to us, it meant then what it means now. What it means now may be a legitimate development of it, but we need to be fair to the texts themselves uh, and, and listen to them. We didn't need to look far to observe injustice and cruelty. Yeah. Uh, the inequality in the country and the Jubilee. Yeah. Yeah. How are we doing for time, Richard? I think we're probably at the point, Ken, where we need to move on and then we're yeah. going to come back. To yeah, glad to. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, thank you, Ken. You know, thank you for all those comments coming in and keep them flowing. Yeah. So, want to thank Ken for his contribution so far and say so we'll have opportunity to, to come back um, to, to engage a bit more with Ken later on. But I'm going to hand over to, um, to David now, who's going to lead us in our next um, part of Thinking for Tonight. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, I actually sort of want to start tonight thinking about uh, some of the things that have actually come out of some of those comments, how we challenge injustice and how we long for fruitfulness today. And so I want to actually start with some of the words that Ken finished his uh, input with. Uh, he said, rage and redemption are two sides of the same coin. This is true of God, of Jesus and of the community of God's people, the body of Christ. The point of raging against injustice is to redeem. The passion to redeem and create justice necessarily involves identifying and raging against injustice. And I want to, thinking about those words, they ask the question about how comfortable we feel challenging injustice today with rage and what redemption may look like in today's political world. I don't think that rage fits easily into our vocabulary. I don't think it fits easily into our vocabulary around democracy. And I don't think it fits easily into our vocabulary about faith. Rage can easily become associated with revolutionary politics, the angry mob staging a coup and reactionary groups who are more interested in anarchy than they are in democracy. And we certainly don't do rage in church. Well, maybe we do, but we say that we shouldn't. I remember many years ago going past a, a Methodist church, which had a wayside pulpit, proclaiming boldly the gospel and saying, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And I think for me, that sums up many, how many people see the church from the inside and from the outside. They see it as a place of faith, which is nice. Personally, I would ban the word nice from the English language. I think it's a dreadful world. And I don't think as Christians, we are called to be nice, but I think sometimes that gets in the way of what we're talking about in terms of rage. So why is rage such a feared emotion? 
If you look in a dictionary to define the word, you'll find two entries. Well, I found two entries in the, in the dictionary that I looked in anyway. One is violent, uncontrollable anger. And I would suggest that's somewhere where our reticence comes from, especially with that word uncontrolled. That's why we don't like rage. But the second slightly different definition that I found was a vehement desire or passion. And I suggest that that offers a more comfortable definition and perhaps helps us think about rage in terms of how we challenge injustice today. Having said that, even though I know we're thinking about Isaiah, I would argue that we see both definitions in the life of Jesus. The famous example we always quote, of course, is the turning of the tables, which is that violent anger. We can debate whether that was controlled or uncontrolled, but that was more of that, what we see rage to be. In terms of a vehement desire or passion, one story that I often turn to, and a story that I think shows one of the biggest political acts of Jesus' life is when he heals the man's hand on the Sabbath. There is a vehement desire and passion in Jesus to show love and to, to offer healing, even though he knows it will break the law. So if we are happy to at least accept the second definition of rage, uh, the question for us today is then, how do we rage against injustice within a democracy? How do we speak in a prophetic voice similar to that of Isaiah and the other prophets? In Isaiah 1.17, we hear the words to seek justice and rebuke the oppressor. How do we seek justice and rebuke the oppressor, the oppressor today in our society? We've already had a comment about whether or not a prophetic voice like Isaiah's would be, um, would be more welcome in Isaiah's time or in today's time. So how do we rage in a democracy when actually we've got the opportunity to vote? We have the right to vote. Those of us that are of uh, an age to vote, we can, when we are presented with local elections and with national elections, we can actually say this is who we want to be in authority. We can also rage, though, in democracy in other ways, because Democracy is not just about voting. Along with voting, we have the right to lobby. We can lobby locally and nationally. We can send petitions, we can sign petitions, or we can send letters or emails. We can join marches. Our church leaders can speak out, and we can do all of this passionately. We can do this, and we can rage. Over the past year or so, the Joint Public Issues team have been encouraging people to campaign on the Nationalities and Borders Bill. We believe that the legislation is unjust. It is unfair. It discriminates against people who are in genuine need. And we believe that goes against all that we are taught as Christians. And we encourage people to write letters. We encourage people to send postcards. We encourage people to join demonstrations. We encouraged our church leaders to speak out. And all these things happened. At one point, we uh, produced a, a letter that was signed by over a thousand faith leaders. And I think it's fair to say that many of us were very passionate about it. Many of us were raging about what we were seeing as a law that was being proposed to be passed in our name, in our country. But then, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, it still got passed through Parliament. Unfortunately, this was not a great surprise, but there was still a lot of disappointment. Then almost out of the blue came this announcement, and I'm sure you'll remember it, about the government saying not only were we going, you know, the Nationalities and Borders Bill, but we were going to send people to Rwanda who had come here illegally, as the government would put it. It felt like a kick in the stomach. And this week, someone said to me, just let me know where that first flight to Rwanda is taking off from, and I will chain myself to anything, whatever it takes to stop it. As well as our democratic right to vote, to lobby, to speak out, we also have a right, if we choose, to nonviolent direct option, a uh, direct action as an option, much like the turning of the tables. 
But what of redemption? A reminder that Ken said to us that uh, rage and redemption were the two sides of the same coin. And the point of raging against injustice is to redeem. I think we can all see that raging against injustice that leads to justice is redemption. But so often when we rage, so often when we engage in democracy, we can feel that nothing changes like the campaign with the Nationalities and Borders Bill. I think it's a hard but basic truth that redemption can only be offered. We can't force redemption on anybody. I've already quoted Isaiah 117 that says, seek, seek justice and rebuke the oppressor. Our task is to rebuke the oppressor for as long as it takes until the oppressor chooses that path of justice and redemption. And this is hard and it makes it very difficult sometimes when we are trying to challenge injustice, when we are trying to find fruitfulness in our modern day life. But for those, it has to be an acknowledgement that we need to continue to seek justice, even when redemption seems a long way away. And we can all point to events in our lives where we've seen uh, justice happening, where we've seen great moments of change, of uh, systemic change. And we know that actually that was a result of a long, long journey. I don't want to end on a depressing note, but I want to be realistic that challenging injustice, and the prophets knew this, <laughs> you know, the prophets, as Ken's already said, were unpopular. They knew that people weren't ready list necessary to listen and that they kept having to repeat themselves. But that's part of us challenging injustice. And so we're going we're gonna to go into um, groups again. And I've got a couple of questions that you can choose to discuss. Um, and they are, firstly, how should the church and individual Christians express their rage uh, within a democratic state? And the second one is, do you agree that redemption can only ever be offered? Or can we redeem sinful policies in other ways? So um, we'll be put back into our... Um, our breakout rooms and I think we'll have a similar amount of time about five minutes just to discuss one or other or something else that you'd like to discuss having listened to what I've just said. So welcome back uh, people are beginning to gather back in the main room um, same same drill as we had after uh, your last breakout group if you've got any comments or or questions or real gems of um, you know, insight that came out of your groups, please pop them in the chat. We'll have a quick look at them now, but we are going to um, allow for time at the end of this to, to pick some of them up and to have a conversation around them. Um, and of course, you know, we're only gathering for an hour and a quarter. This is really a chance to start the conversations. Uh, so, um, you know, the things that you've discussed, you can uh, discuss them with others with, um, or, you know, if you know the people that have been in your, your room, your breakout rooms, you can discuss them as well, with them as well as you carry on um, reflecting on Isaiah and what it means to, um, you know, to, to have that prophetic voice. So, yeah, please just uh, into, uh, into the chat, anything that came out of your group. Um, We've got, uh, got one there about how issues do take time to be resolved and uh, uh, Northern Ireland is, uh, is a real example of, uh, of that as well. We won't talk too much about the current uh, situation either, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the issues around nonviolent demonstration, and of course, uh, we see that a lot at the moment, don't we, with climate, with the climate campaign and that and that sense, uh, you know, I, I get the sense that many people feel that they, they're turning to that now because they feel that time is really running out and so they really want people to listen. Either nobody else got anything to say or you're all writing essays, um, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, it's the typing we'll just... of it that's the problem. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying that uh, in, in in a church that I had in Yorkshire, uh, we we did a little census of people's involvement in some kind of service outside the church. And it was just astonishing. People volunteering at the hospital, people working in charity shops, people working with CAB, and it went on and on. And, yeah. um, you know, that is in part an answer to the first question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is indeed. Thank you for that. I, I couldn't work out who was... Uh, who was speaking but thank you for whoever whoever um was was sharing that with us i think you're right um, yeah. so um just just noting that the the ones here now please carry on and do it if you want uh yeah just keep the keep them coming in we'll look at them uh we'll look at them in at the end of the session but i, I think now i really need to hand over to hannah uh to to lead her part of this session thanks hannah thanks dave so we're going into our final part um, of the session now, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time applying some of the thoughts that we've heard this evening and to think about where we might be equipped to take action in living out our longing for God's justice. And we can already see some of those sort of questions that we might talk about now being picked up in the chat in your comments so far. And um, so hopefully this should, should lead to some interesting um, conversation. So right uh, back in his first presentation, Ken spoke about how the Gospels and the writing of Paul are particularly concerned with how we live out the understanding of what God is, God does. And if we believe that God's justice encompasses not only the alleviation of injustice, but the complete eradication of it, then living out this understanding means that our calling to justice is a calling to the same practice. And this is a really practical thing. It means not only understanding what God's justice looks like, but really getting our hands dirty and seeking to bring it about. I think that so often for our churches, we begin to identify injustice by the experience of it in our communities. Churches are often part of community networks, whether that's simply by the relationships that their members hold, who the buildings are used by, or by the networks and events that they provide from dropping clubs to youth groups to 12-step groups, food banks, debt advice centres, cafes and so much more, churches are often the place to hear about how the community around them is experiencing injustice. So our understanding of injustice today begins here in these relationships with our communities. And our calling is not only to understand these experiences of injustice, but to respond to them as well. Responding to these injustices is not just about the alleviation of their symptoms, but about asking why do they exist in the first case, and in doing so, seeking to understand how they can be eradicated completely. So how can we be equipped to do this as the church today with some of the, the crises that we face? And I think being equipped to respond to injustice in our own church and community contexts is first about learning how to ask the right questions. So I'm going to take the current cost of living crisis as an example. So right now we know that the cost of living, uh, the core costs of living are rising at a rapid rate. Church communities are likely to be seeing this in multiple ways. The impact of price rises is so widespread that it's likely that almost everyone in our church communities is financially affected in some way. We're also likely to see the cost of church expenses going up. And quite crucially, for the countless number of churches who are involved with emergency food provisions such as food banks, breakfast clubs and drop-in centres, we're seeing the need for these services rise astronomically. The Food Foundation estimated a 57% rise in food insecurity between January and April this year, and 7.3 million adults did not have sufficient food because they were unable to afford it last month. So here we have an experience of injustice in our communities. As many have pointed out, this is a humanitarian crisis as people are unable to afford the basic necessities. So we need to get equipped to respond. And our first question to ask is, who is most affected here? And I want to note that crucially, as we ask these questions, we can look to others for the expertise in order to find the answers. This might be expertise drawn through experience of the issue we're exploring or through research or work on the topic. As we begin to draw in other people to our conversations around these injustice, we're better equipped to find productive answers to our questions. So our first question, who is most affected? As we began to respond to the cost of living crisis, 
JPIT have been working with the Church on the Margins project to speak with communities. And we've identified anecdotally that these experts by experience in being hit by the cost of living crisis hard, it's the least well off in our communities who are being hit hardest. And as we turn to those conducting research to see if this was backed up, we found that it was because those with the smallest budgets spend more of their money on essentials, the rise in prices is hitting harder. Whilst the headline rate of inflation is 9% at the moment, the effective inflation rate for the poorest families is conservatively estimated at about 11% for the year to April 2022. This is still likely to be an underestimate as the cost of cheaper foods are rocketing during, due to lower profit margins. So we've asked who, and we see that there is a major imbalance in this crisis, deepening the injustice and placing the heaviest burden on, on those who are least able to bear it. And our next question is why? The rise in cost of living is being experienced across the board, and so much of it is affected by unprecedented circumstances, such as the war in Ukraine. Yet why aren't those with the least resources better equipped and protected from the impacts of this crisis. The government are pouring billions into responding. What difference is this making for the people who need it the most? To answer this question, we turn to those who've been analysing and campaigning around poverty and inequality issues for some time, such as the Trussell Trust and the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. And when we ask why, we find out that the adequacy of the benefit system has been lacking for some time. In April 2022, the government decided to increase benefits only by 3.1%, rather than the inflation rate of 7% as estimated at the time. This represents a 12.5 billion cut in real terms in benefits. Only a few months before, the £20 universal credit uplift was removed and replaced with a change in the taper rate, which would have the most impact on the wealthiest universal credit claimants those unable to work due to illness, disability or caring responsibilities don't benefit from this change. There have been some welcome introductions to address the cost of living crisis and how it's hitting the poorest hardest. Direct payments to the lowest income households introduced in May, introducing targeted support for people receiving disability benefits and more support with energy bills. And these uh, introductions of these measures have been targeted towards those on the lowest incomes, which is a big step in the right direction. However, they're simply a sticking plaster. In the long run, we need measures which address the inherent inequality that means the least well off aren't protected from the crisis we face in our communities. So we come to our third question, what needs to change? There's a great, great quote I'm sure you're familiar with attributed to Desmond Tutu. There comes a point when we need to stop pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Sometimes this is the point where churches step back. A little bit of what Dave was talking about earlier. We can find ourselves saying, oh, politics isn't for us. Uh, it's our job to provide the hands-on support and we should be focusing on our communities rather than on politics and on parliament. And that's not to say that those things aren't really important, that the hands-on work of food provision, the emergency re relief and response is absolutely the role of our churches. But if we're serious about responding to injustice as God does, then we cannot stop short of addressing it at the source. This is perhaps where the tough love comes in that's in our title for this evening's webinar. We need to be people who speak truth to power, that call for the radical changes that we need to see in order for justice to be found. So the cost of living crisis. We need to seek urgent policy changes that strengthen our social security system, that it means it provides when people are in need. Right now, the quickest and easiest mechanism is to increase benefits in line with today's inflation rate of 9%. Our friends at Action for Children and the Trussell Trust have been calling for this privately and publicly for some months. We need a holistic review of the changes needed in order to reduce costs and increase income, such as making rents cheaper, ensuring living wages for those able to work and investment in local support services. 
we need to speak this truth to power to say that whilst welcome the current um, measures in responding to the crisis aren't enough we need to source some of that rage at this injustice and direct that this in a way that enables us to respond productively and i think for churches our role to play here doesn't take us outside of the communities we live in but deeper within them we need to be part of building an understanding within our communities and with our elected representatives that benefits are currently not enough to live on. We can do this through listening and through sharing stories of those struggling, alongside stories of the projects which, which help, which churches are often so involved with. And by building a relationship with our elected officials, we can have honest and productive conversations about these issues. As we turn to others for help in this, we can deepen our understanding in order to better approach the injustice that we see. Right back at the start of our time together this evening, Ken began by inviting us to identify where we see injustice and to flip it on its head to look for justice. The next step then is to seek this justice wholeheartedly and practically, not stopping with the symptoms, but asking the right questions to identify the causes. This is work that draws us deeper into community with one another by listening and honouring the experiences of those around us and by growing the power that we need to have to make a change. So some questions for discussion for you as we go into our final set of breakout rooms. Where have I experienced or heard about an experience of injustice in my community today? And who could help me answer the questions I have about the source of this injustice. So really thinking here about where your experiences might have been or where you, the experiences of your community are. And that next step in thinking about who we might be able to go to in order to build up our knowledge of the issue and the right response. So if we can go back into to breakout rooms, Michael, that'd be great. Brilliant, I think we're all um, coming back into the main room now. I hope you had um, productive and, and helpful final conversations um, in those small groups. And just again, would encourage you to, to pop your thoughts in the chat and the things that you were you were talking about. Um, particularly uh, encourage you to think in this these last few minutes of our time together, is there a question or a thought that's that's in your mind, something that's come to the to the top of your mind as we've been speaking, something you're curious to go and find out more about or to reflect on further? If you've got that kind of presiding question in, in your heart or on your mind um, as, we're, as we're wrapping up this evening, do put that into the chat because um, I'm sure it'd be helpful for others to, to think about that as they go away from, from this evening as well. I'm sorry you only had a short bit of time to talk together. We could tell by the fact that you all stayed in your breakout room right till the last second this time and um, that the conversations must have been good. Um, so hopefully, uh, like Dave said earlier, it's just the start of your of your time talking to either to one another um, or to those in your church communities as you go away, go away from here and, and think about how we can explore Isaiah more in Bible Month. Probably a good opportunity for me to be a good uh, a good employee and do a little plug for JPIT as well. If you if you've been intrigued by the conversations this evening and you want to carry them on, um, come and join in with the work that we're doing in the Joint Public Issues team. I'll put our website in the chat. Um, but there's lots of spaces that we host to to keep these conversations going. Um, we actually run a weekly podcast where we look at the lectionary readings and how they might be applied um, to the things that are going on in today's world. Um, a bit like we've done this evening, kind of taking the text and then looking at uh, how that um, enables us to speak uh, into the context of our, of our current society. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Thank you to Anne for raising the importance of partnership there. Absolutely. Um, churches sometimes think that we can do it all by ourselves, don't we? When actually there's somebody just around the corner who, who knows um, so much more about what we might be facing. So really, really helpful um, to share. And great, Melanie, that you're already making those connections with people you can go away and talk to. Um, really, really good. Brilliant. So we're just going to go into a, a final a bit of time together where, um, where all of the panellists will come back onto screen and we'll have a chat through um, some of our final thoughts from this evening. So I will hand back to Richard. Thanks, Hannah, and thank you for the contributions we've already been putting into chat, everyone.
I thought in this in this final um, time together that I might just ask uh, Ken, David, and Hannah just for any any of their reflections on what they've seen in chat. We'll pick up on one or two of the things that we haven't had a chance to pick up in chat as well. So I wonder whether, whether Ken, well, I might turn to you first, just for your reflections on on our conversation together tonight. I've been fascinated by the way the conversations have been going, and if only they could be longer, but that's uh, uh, that, that's something we've just got to live with and keep working with. What particularly interests me is uh, uh, something that I'm very passionate about, is that we have this difficult task at the moment. We have to pay attention, deep respect, to the biblical texts and the situations that they come from and what they're talking about. We're, uh, we need to pay attention to what people were thinking God was doing in their time in the way they understood. And we need to pay deep respect and attention to the contemporary world and the situation it finds itself in and the way people do it. And then we're meant to be putting jump leads between the two and that's really hard and the prophets found it hard as well and some people will emphasize one side or the other. that's fine but as a corporate body we need to be doing both and where churches go wrong is they don't do either they might say they're biblical and they might say they're in the contemporary world but if they're not paying that sort of deep respect to both they're not making the jump leads and they're living in a bubble which is neither relating to the world nor actually relating to God. And if that's a prophetic comment, I meant it to be. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Um, David, I wonder if I can turn to you for, for your reflections at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's something about, about those jump leads that, that Ken was talking about uh, in terms of you know, sometimes it's easy to talk about oppression and injustice as things that um, happen to other people that are, you know, maybe in a different part of the world. But actually, the truth is, as is as we are being seen as and as Hannah really brought out in her reflection on the cost of living, you know, these injustices are taking place in our communities, they're taking place in our churches, they're taking place in our families, they're taking place in our households. We, you know, and so actually for, for the church to speak out or for us to be involved in seeking justice, actually we're, it's not about doing it necessarily for others. It's actually about doing it for the communities that we serve, very, the very real communities that we serve. And so I think, you know, that, that gives us some, and not quite what the jump leads were that Ken was talking about, but I think something of that and reflecting on the, the actually, and that our God wants redemption for the world and wants the sinful structures of our world where people are homeless where people ha don't have enough money to feed their family where you know there is war where there is conflict where where refugees are turned away that is sinful and god wants to that all to be redeemed and as god called isaiah to be a prophet to speak out against those things in isaiah's day so god calls us to speak and act out in our day Thanks, David. And Hannah, if I can turn to you for your final reflections. Yeah. And um, so I was just thinking as as we reflected um, throughout this evening that we haven't talked a huge amount about hope. And I think that's probably the third the third thing that sits alongside our, our rage and our redemption. Um but that sometimes can be hard to find when we're when we're deeply entrenched in seeking out and, and combating injustice. We often find it hard to look for the hope. But perhaps as um Ken and Dave have been saying, um, it's one of the things that ties together um, the the moment of the of the prophets and the moment of today is that we both have the same hope um, in what God's kingdom looks like. We're both aiming for the same thing. We're just starting from different points potentially. Um, and so actually, yeah, I'm challenged to think in each of these situations, what do I look towards um, as well as how do I um, know more about where we find ourselves? Um, and hopefully that gives us energy on the journey as well. Thank you, Hannah. I'd like to thank uh, Ken, Dave and Hannah for their contributions. I'd like to thank all of you for the way you've contributed. We, we're really aware that we've only really just been able to just, well, not even lift, lift the lid on, on this topic as we look together at Isaiah and, and the follow-on action that we might want to take away from Bible Month and continue to engage with. 
Um, but I'm really grateful for the way you've engaged, for the comments you've been putting in chat and for the sharing together through the, the breakout groups as well. Uh, one of the things that struck me really is that, that task of continuing to work together. I think that that sense of being in this community can, as, as church community, yes, we can do all those things individually, but it, it's so much uh, more powerful when we share in, in this work of seeking justice together. Uh, and that, that element of looking for hope in all, or knowing that we have that hope actually in all of this work that we do. So I'd encourage you to continue to reflect on Isaiah throughout Bible Month and beyond, uh, doing that work of linking the biblical text and the context in which the biblical text is written to our context today, both of those together, um, rather than none of those as we seek to follow this up further. And that we would all continue to follow up on this topic of rage and redemption, prophesying tough love for today. So I'd encourage you to pick up and reflect together on what we can do in these situations of injustice, how we can respond individually, and as I've said, perhaps more importantly, collectively, to engage with the Joint Public Issues team, to engage with the Walking with Micah project, uh, and to engage with the biblical text as we continue to, to reflect together on Isaiah. So thank you uh, to our panellists. Thank you to everyone, all of you that have joined in our webinar tonight. And, and thank you too for those that might be watching this uh, from the recording. And I, we hope that you, you gain as much from it as we can now share together um, in this uh, live session this evening. I'm going to hand over to Hannah now just to draw our time finally to a close with a closing prayer. Hannah, thank you. Thank you. So I'll just take a moment of quiet before we pray to finish our evening together. Loving God, might we remember um, that we start from you, the God who is love and who so loved the world that you gave yourself to be amongst us. This is the source of our hope. This is our vision for justice and for peace in the earth today. But I pray that um, from our conversation this evening, um, you would grow in our hearts a desire for your justice that you would strengthen our relationships and our connections, that we might be able to work with others to seek your justice. God, we hold before you those who feel the pain of injustice, those who are struggling to afford um, the bare essentials, those who are the victims of hate and prejudice. God, we know that your love is deep enough and wide enough to encompass them. Might we join with you in loving those around us by seeking your justice today and as we go forward. Would you bless us as we leave our time together this evening? In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Anna. And I must say one final thank you to Michael, who's been working in the background um, with the technical aspects of Zoom tonight. Michael's not feeling great himself. So, Michael, we wish you a, a full recovery from COVID too. And thank you to the rest of the team, learn, members of the Learning Network, who's been putting together the resources for our engagement with Bible Month this year. Uh, I mustn't, yeah, mustn't forget to say thank you to them. But thank you tonight to Ken, David and Hannah and to all of you. And we look forward to you continuing to engage with the webinars and other ways of engagement with Bible Month uh, throughout June and beyond. Thanks everyone, good night.